check. Test one, two, one, two, check, check.
to Silver Creek Fellowship this morning. Those of you in person and online, we're so glad that you've joined us this morning. I do want to remind you that are here of a few things. One is the bathroom, which is around the corner. We do ask that you wear a mask if you go inside to use that. And also, we do have people um, available and willing to pray with you during the rest of worship in the back. If you go back there at any time, they'll pray for whatever you have need for this morning. We're going to keep worshiping with a few more songs. Take
giving it all to you. 100% we are surrendered.
sing that again. You are here. You are here. Moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. 
Yes, Lord, we believe that. Lord, you keep all of your promises. Even when it feels like you aren't, Lord, we believe that you are. You are working miracles when we don't even feel it. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your promises. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. All right. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, worship team. Well, welcome, everyone, to Silver Creek Fellowship. I am Kurt, and I am so glad to be with you guys uh, here today. And before we jump into our message, there's just a few things I would love to point out. And one of them is you will find in your bulletin a few things today that I'd love for you to look at. One of them is your connection card. This connection card provides you a way to interact with us, to engage in conversation with us, to have us follow up with you. It also provides a way for you to get your prayer requests and your answers to prayer into us. And I told you this last week, and I'm so glad that you listened because we had so many more cards at prayer on Tuesday than the week before. What we do on Tuesday morning is we take every one of these prayer requests at 6.30 at our prayer meeting, and we pray through each and every one. And church, I'm telling you, God hears us and responds to our prayer. The Word of God tells us that when we gather together, when we pray together, and when we agree on things in Jesus' name, that He is powerful, He's willing, He's able, and He responds to our requests. So take the time fill out your prayer request, and then at the end of our service, drop them in one of those uh, metal boxes there in the back. If you're watching online right now, you can click the button that says connection card, and you can fill out a card and your prayer request as well there. The next thing I want to show you is that in your bulletin, if you're here in person, you have this thing that says serve on Sundays. Now, you may or may not be aware um, that what we are doing outside in the tent takes more work than doing a service in a pre-set up auditorium inside. Now, we came outside because people, that would be you, said, let's get outside. Let's change the way we're doing things. We don't like doing it with masks. We don't like doing things the way that we had done before. So here we are, but to do this, it requires a lot of of work. My shift starts at 5 a.m. on Sunday morning to get tech stuff set up out here, and all of the stuff that you see in front of you and the stuff that you're sitting on has to be up and down every single week. What that means is we need your help. So if you are willing to help us in several different areas, you can uh, engage in a conversation with us again by checking the box on this card, filling out your name and information, and dropping it in the boxes on the back. I just want to really quick tell you, this may be intimidating to you. And you may say, like, well, that's all fine and dandy, but I can't help. I can tell you there's something that we can help and train you to do at almost every level. So if you're willing to come, whether before service or after service, or you're willing to to participate in hospitality or in greeting, um, we have a place for you to serve, to use your God-given gifts, and we would love to help you to discover those. The next one that I want to point out is that family camp is is right around the corner. Now, you may not have ever gone on a family camp trip with us, but I'm telling you this is one of the best things we do because it literally is just going camping together. If you like to camp, then come with us. We will be at uh, Cove Palisades this year, a new park to us, but a wonderful, wonderful lake there at Lake Billy Chinook. We're going to be at the state campground. If you're interested, we still have sites available for you to sign up, and you can find information out about that. Whether you're able to stay with us for the whole week or just part of the week, there's a place for you to go sign up online. Okay, now, I want to jump right into our message today because we've been in this sermon series called The Power of Confident Living that we kicked off on Easter Sunday. And as we progress through this series, over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be talking to you. And this week, my topic is um, how do we heal or how are we healed when we have a damaged self-confidence? Because uh, you might agree with me or have a testimony you could share that life can be pretty tough sometimes. Anyone? Yeah? Yeah. Life can be pretty tough sometimes. Life can be frustrating. Life can be hard. And we all go through hurts and we all have habits and pain that result in scars in our life. So today what I want to do is I want to look with you at how do we see those scars in our life, those scars in our self-confidence, how do we see them healed by God? And I think one of the things that scars our self-confidence the most 
One of the things that really just leaves a huge amount of scars in our life is rejection. Anyone else ever experienced any rejection? Okay, we've all been rejected to one degree or another. We all face it. This is universal. Uh, if I were to say here today, how many of you have been re rejected at some point in your life? It'd be 100% of hands unless you're a liar, and then we'll talk about that after the service, okay? <laughs> Listen, we live in an imperfect world. We live in a world that's broken, and as a result of it, there's a lot of pain in this world, and rejection is one of those huge areas that, that so often cause us to withdraw, so often cause us to really struggle in our relationship with God. Now, some of us, we develop coping mechanisms. We develop uh, habits to help us avoid rejection because we think if we just were perfect enough, then people wouldn't reject us. But did you know that that's an absolute lie? Because there's been one perfect person in this world before, and guess what happened with him? He was still rejected. The Bible tells us in the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 3, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and he looked, sorry, we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we didn't care. John 1, 11, he came to his own people and even they rejected him. So Jesus understood rejection, and he was perfect. So all of you that are trying to be perfect in order to escape rejection, guess what? It doesn't work. It doesn't work, because only one person's ever been perfect, and it didn't work for him. Now, there are so many different ways that we face rejection in our daily life. We face rejection physically. We face it socially. We face it emotionally. But I think one of the most common ones that that carry so many scars in our life is that verbal rejection, that verbal rejection. Maybe you've heard some of these phrases before. What in the world is wrong with you anyway? Why can't you be more like? You are always screwing everything up. Can't you do anything right? I can't believe that you would do a thing like that. You're never going to amount to anything. And then the labels that we put on people. You are clumsy. You're slow. You're weak. You're no good. You're dumb. All these things we pile on each other. And those are the nice ones, the Sunday version ones that I chose to use here today. A lot of you have a long list of things that have been said to you over the years. And many of you can actually remember all the way back to the playground to your school years, because let me just tell you, the playground and school years can be some of the most formative and brutal experiences in your young life. As you grow up, the names that people would call you, and we have those really uh, bad sayings, like sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Ha! Huh, are you kidding me? That's, that's a terrible saying. I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off me. and stick. That's, you Listen, words hurt. Names hurt. The Bible actually tells us this. Proverbs 12, 18 says, Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words can heal. Did you know your, wound, your, your words can wound as deep as a sword? And a lot of us carry wounds from words that have been spoken to you over your life, and we all face rejection. And when we're rejected, here's the problem. When you're rejected over and over, you begin to project that rejection on your other relationships. So you view yourself as a reject. And that goes into every area of your life, including your spiritual life. You begin to think that God views you the way that your mom or dad or friend spoke those words to you. You begin to reject God because you feel unworthy of his love. So how does God heal these scars? How does God heal our self-confidence? Because the Bible tells us in Psalm 143, verse 3, this is what it says, God heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up their wounds. He bandages their wounds. And if you've been hurt, anyone here, if you've been hurt, God wants to help you today. See, God cares deeply about your hurts, and he wants to heal your broken heart. He wants to bind up your wounds today. Great, that sounds good, right? How? How? How does he do that? Well, I think Romans 12, 2, a verse that we come back to as a congregation repeatedly tells us how. It says this, 
This is Paul writing. He says, don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. The way we think affects the way we feel. And the way we feel affects the way we act. And so God, what he wants to do with us today is help us change the way we think. Here, have you ever been to one of those fun houses or carnivals or fair that has um, one of those distorted mirror rooms before? Has anyone ever been into one of those with the distorted mirrors? Yeah. So you go in and one mirror makes you look bigger and skinnier. We like that one. The other mirror makes you look fatter and shorter. We don't like that one. And when you look in these distorted images, they distort your view of yourself. And did you know that throughout life, other people have been like those distorted mirrors, projecting back to you an image of you that isn't accurate? But see, here's the problem. Do you guys know any perfect people? Anyone here a perfect person? No. So even we, even we project distorted images onto other people. The fact is we buy into a lot of lies that our culture tells us, that maybe your parents told you, that maybe somebody said to you, they told you you don't matter, they told you you're not significant, they told you you were never going to amount to anything. And we, over time, when it's said enough, we start to buy into it and believe it. And that distortion grows in our life. So here's what I want to do. I want to help you break free of those distorted images of yourself because this is what the bible says jesus speaking about the truth said this and you shall know the truth and what the truth will bring you freedom the truth will set you free that's what jesus told us the truth you'll know my word you'll know my truth and that will set you free see you have been held captive in your mind in your life by words that were spoken over you maybe years ago Maybe some of you who are here today have still been listening to voices, to tape cassettes, that shows my age, sorry, to uh, digital music files playing over and over again in your head that were spoken years ago, but that you can't seem to shake. Well, Jesus says, when you know my truth, it will set you free. So today, this is what I want to do, the whole rest of the message, I just want to speak some truth over your life. Some truth that if you understand and if you believe will bring you freedom, will bring you transformation, will change the way you think, which will change the way you feel, which will change the way you act. Because you might not know this because our culture is not telling you this very often these days, but you have a choice in life about what you set your mind and what you set your um your focus on. Now, that kind of goes against our culture, but we have to understand that there's a process that we must go through in our discipleship of Jesus where we intentionally set our mind on the things that are true and not focus on the untruths that have been spoken over you for years. Now, it's easier said than done, but it's a work that we must commit ourselves to. So here's some truths I want to give you today, and I hope that these will help you when it comes to changing the way we think. And here's the first truth that God wants to speak to you today. Number one is this. God says, I'm acceptable. You may have been told differently, but God says, I accept you. See, in our world, we all work really hard to be accepted. We buy things and we wear things and we join things all just for the benefit of being accepted by our peers. But did you ever, when you were a kid, take a foolish dare because you thought, man, if I do this, they're going to like me. And if they like me, then I'll be accepted into the group. Man, we did some really dumb stuff growing up in order to be accepted. And I say growing up, and I mean some of you that was yesterday, okay? Some of us it was yesterday because we're still in the process of growing up. We're still all the time in that process. We all do these things but to gain acceptance. But the Bible says in Ephesians 1, chapter 6, it says this, to the praise of the glory of His grace, 
by which he made us accepted in the beloved. See, this is what Jesus Christ has done for you and I. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you, because of him, he made you accepted. Circle that. He made us accepted. Look at another verse, Romans 15, verse 7. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. Circle, has accepted you. Because, listen, is there any qualifications in those verses? Is there anything in there that gives conditions in either one of them? No, it talks about them as if they were a done deal. Do you know why Paul chose that language? Because it is a done deal. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are accepted. You are accepted because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. But most of us never realize this. See, here's the problem. We use language like this. Have you accepted Jesus into your heart? Which is an important step, but here's what we never then say, is Jesus has accepted you. It's not just you accepting him. He has accepted you. And that's a wonderful thing if you understand it. Psalm chapter 27 verse 10 says this, Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. Now, some of you had very unpleasant and unpleasable parents. They were perfectionists on your behalf. So no matter how hard you tried, no matter what you did, you could never win their approval. You tried and you tried, but if you got a B, they wanted an A. And if you got an A, then you needed that A plus with extra credit. And nothing you ever did could ever get their approval because it wasn't good enough. And if that's you here today, if you've been trying to win the approval of your parents, maybe even into your late adult life, still trying to do whatever you can do to win your parents' approval, I want to say to you two things this morning. Number one, in all likelihood you're never going to get it. Not because of you, but because of who they are and the way that they've been shaped and formed. So you're never going to get it. And number two, listen to this, you don't need it. You don't need their approval in order to be whole or happy. And what a relief that is if you understand it. What a relief that is if you get it. Let me ask you a question. What do you think God made the church for? We are supposed to be each other's forever family. And you and I may not have been accepted in our birth family, but guess what? In God's family, the church, you are accepted here. The scripture we just read said accept each other. Why? Because Christ has accepted you. And there's a place for you right here in this church to be accepted, to be loved, to share your life with each other. Okay, so number one is you're accepted. Number two, God says you're valuable. You're acceptable and you are valuable. Luke chapter 12, verse 24. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for God feeds them. And you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Circle, far more valuable. God says to us, you're valuable to him. You're more than just acceptable, you're valuable. So how much are you worth? Now, I'm not talking about money. Because, see, we often confuse our self-worth and our net worth. Because in our culture, we often look at the net worth and think that self-worth is directly connected to that. But the two are very, very different. In fact, Rick Warren uses this little uh, phrase. He says, your value has nothing to do with your valuables right? Because your value and your valuables are very different things. Jesus thought that this was so important that you and I understand this, that an entire chapter of the Bible, Luke chapter 15, is three parables, three stories. The story of the lost son, the story of the lost coin, and the story of the lost sheep, where the entire punchline to all three is that you matter, your life matters to God. You are valuable to Him. 
Now, we're going to say this over and over throughout this series, but you matter to God. You're valuable. And we are watching something in our culture that's actually crazy going on right now in this area of value. I don't know if you're confused about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, but I'm telling you, it is insane what's happening right now all around us. This week, Bitcoin is worth over $60,000 per coin. Now, we say coin because we're actually not comfortable with using terms like $60,000 per long string of numbers, okay? Because that's what it is. It's digital. It, it's not a coin. It's not physical in any way. Now, let me say this about value. Just because you don't get it doesn't mean it's not valuable. See, you may shake your head and scoff at Bitcoin because you say, huh, it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't mean people aren't making millions of dollars on it. See, if I told you this flash drive in my pocket right here costs $3.88 on Amazon, so that would make it worth $3.88, right? But if I told you on this flash drive there were three digital strands of Bitcoin, what would that make it worth? A whole lot more, right? Suddenly, this becomes very, very valuable. Because what is our value built on? There's not three Bitcoin on that, by the way. <laughs> if, there, if there were, it wouldn't be in my pocket. Yeah. So what's value determined by? What somebody's willing to pay for it. That's what determines value, what someone's willing to pay for it. That's how the whole system works, like it or not. Something is worth what somebody will give you for it. If you've been watching what's been happening with these digital uh, pieces of art and these digital tokens and digital trading cards, people are paying millions of dollars for JPEG pictures that they store on their computer. And you think, well, that's so silly. It's what people are willing to pay for it. Let me ask you a question. You may feel like you have no, valuable, no value in the world. You may feel like a real zero. You may feel like garbage. But what was God willing to pay for you? He gave his one and only son, Jesus. He gave the blood of his only son. Think about that for a minute. God of the universe who spoke all things into being. The God of creation, the one that was in heaven on the throne, came down to this world and sacrificed his life to purchase yours. So what value do you have to him? It's infinite. It's infinite because the blood of Jesus is infinitely valuable. And he spilled it, shed it for your life. So whether you get it or not, whether it makes sense to you or not, your life has been purchased by the blood of Jesus, and that makes you incredibly valuable. Number three, God says you're lovable. God says you are lovable. That's what God says about you, that he loves you. Isaiah 54.10, For the mountains may move and the hills disappear, but even then my faithful love for you will remain. My covenant of blessing will never be broken, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. God loves you. And this verse tells us a couple things about God's love. He loves you consistently, and he loves you unconditionally. I say it all the time here, church, but there is nothing ever that you could do that would separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And he could never love you more, and he can never love you less than he does right now in this moment. His love is not like your family's love. It's not like human love. It's not fickle. It's consistent. He doesn't love you more tomorrow or because you behave today or because it's your anniversary. He doesn't suddenly accept you. He loves you not based on any conditions every single day. See, our love, human love, is messy. It goes up and it goes down. It's warm and it's cold, but God's love is nothing like that. He says, my love for you will never run out. It will never end. It's unconditional. You can't earn it. There's nothing you can do to deserve it. It's all based on his grace. See, because here's the thing. With human love that's conditional, what happens when you stop the condition? If love is conditional and the condition changes, then all of a sudden, love is gone. My wife, Summer, and I were at a wedding of one of her close friends that she went to dental school with, and they vowed this. I vow 
to love you until love parts us. You know what that means? Nothing. I love you until I don't. That was their vow to each other on their wedding day. And that's marriage for the most part in our culture is built on this idea of conditional love. As long as I feel the way that I feel about you on my wedding day, we'll stay married. Well, (laughs) have fun with that. It doesn't work, does it? Because your conditions change. Reality comes to bear. Sickness comes in. Health comes in. Kids come in. Things change. And when love is conditional, it gets all kinds of messed up. But God says, I don't love like that. He says, I love you consistently and unconditionally. You never have to wake up in the morning and wonder, what's God going to love me like today? Did I read my Bible enough yesterday that he still loves me? Did I pray enough? Did I worship the right way? Did I do the right things to continue to earn God's love? And thank God it's not like that. Ephesians 3, 18 and 19 says this, And may we have the power to understand, as all of God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand, Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. God says you are lovable. Number four, God says you are forgivable. God says you are forgivable. Aren't you glad for that one, church? Yeah, because none of us are perfect and we all need forgiveness. So I thought I'd give you an illustration today because this illustration, as I was creating this, I was trying to think so often this is how we think about God. So, one beautiful spring Saturday, a man decided to drive his brand new Jeep Wrangler Rubicon Edition up to his mountain cabin to see how the cabin fared throughout the winter. He thought now the snow would be at a low enough level that he could get into the cabin for the first time of the season. So as he progressed up the mountain road, it began to lightly snow. But since he was in his brand new Jeep, Rubicon edition, he thought, I can go through a little snow, and he pressed on forward. Well, the snow began to fall harder and harder. The higher he went up the road, and he contemplated whether or not it was time to turn around, but being in a brand new Jeep Rubicon, he decided he could continue down the trail. Just about the time where he came to his senses and realized he'd gone too far, his right front tire went off the road that he could now not see because of the snow depth and broke his front axle on a stone on the side of the road. So now he had an all new kind of problem. He is in the mountains with no cell reception and his car is broken. So doing what anyone would do to survive, he grabbed the gear out of his Jeep and he hiked up the road in waist-deep snow the next four miles to get to his cabin. And by the time he got there, he was drenched, he was soaked to the bone, he was freezing in his core, only to come around the very last bend and discover that sometime during the winter, his cabin had burned to the ground. At this point, he discovered this was all he could take. And he went over to a tree and he began to cry out to the Lord. And he said, why me, God? Why do these things just keep happening to me? And suddenly a booming voice from heaven spoke and said, because you are a real jerk and make me angry. (laughs) Now, I tell you that story that is very made up. Because that is how a lot of you feel that God thinks about you. A lot of you feel that every time something starts to go wrong, you feel like God is now finally just getting even with me for that thing that I did yesterday or that thing that I did last week or that thing that I did in my childhood or that thing that I've not told anyone else about. Finally, God is settling the score with me. And we carry that into our relationship with God. We believe every time something bad happens, this is God now getting back at me. But is that that how God really treats his children? Not on your life. Isaiah 43, verse 25. 
I am the God who forgives your sins, and I do this because of who I am. I will not hold your sins against you. What a great verse. God doesn't hold our sins against us. This may be the trick that happens in your marriage when you make a mistake and suddenly the argument is about something that happened two years before because we don't forget about stuff. Well, God, in this crazy way, I, I can't figure this one out. God doesn't remember your sin. He forgives it and he forgets it. He doesn't hold it against you. Your sins, if you are in Christ Jesus, have been separated as far from you as the east is from the west. Now, how far is the east and west apart? It's infinite. Every time you move west, you move further from the east. And every time you move east, you move further from the west. And God separated your sin away from you. Listen, this may be life-changing for you to understand. God is not mad at you. God is not mad at you. And we have to get this thinking through our head. If you are in Christ Jesus, God is not upset with you. He's forgiven you. He's wiped the slate clean. Ephesians 1 verse 4. Through what Christ did for us, he decided to make us holy in his eyes. Listen to this. Without a single fault, we stand before God covered with his love. Isn't that wonderful, wonderful news? Do you realize that when God looks at you, what he sees is the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus? When the Father looks at you, he doesn't see a mess. He doesn't see a failure. He doesn't see a lost cause. He sees his precious son, Jesus, and the righteousness of Christ that's been given to you. This is really, really good news, church. God doesn't view you through your sin. He doesn't view you through a lens of failure. He sees in you his beloved son. Did you know that when God made you, and before you were knit together in your mother's womb, God actually already knew in advance the worst stuff you'd ever do. There's no skeletons in your closet when it comes to your relationship with God. Because God knows all all of it. He's not shocked by any of it. He was there when you did it. God knows all of it, and he still, even that, he still chooses to love you, to accept you, to forgive you. And he gave his son Jesus so that when Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, everything that you would ever do was paid for once and for all. If we confess our sins to each other, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is what God's word says to us. If we confess our sins, it's forgiven. Yet we hold ourselves in this thinking that God is just looking for a reason. Watch your step, because God's looking for a reason to punish you. And it's simply not true. Now, some of you who are here today have really, really messed up or are really, really messing up. And you feel like no matter what, I'm too far gone. I've gone too far. I've done too much. But it's not what the Word of God teaches us. Listen to this verse. This is one that you should stick on your fridge. This is one that you should stick on the steering wheel of your car. This is one that you should keep in your heart and memorize. It says this, Isaiah 1.18. Come now, come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. You are forgivable, you are acceptable, you are valuable, you are lovable. And number five, God says you're capable. God says you're capable. Now, here's a verse I want to share with you that is one of those verses that people throw around an awful lot, but I want to give you the context that this verse was meant for you and I because it wasn't meant for just every boxer to wear on his boxing shorts, okay? It's more than just that, and it's Philippians 4.13, and this is what it says. 
It says, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, I think the Amplified Version is so beautiful for this one. If you don't know what the Amplified Version is, the Amplified Version is just a translation of the Bible where they take the verb and they add all of the possible verb meanings into one sentence. So it doesn't read very nice, but it's great when you're trying to break down and study Scripture. And this is what it says in the Amplified, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things which he's called me to do, through him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill his purpose, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses me with inner strength and confident peace. Yeah. Amen. I claimed this verse about 30 minutes ago. I was sitting where Ashley is sitting now, and we were worshiping, and I was tired. Coming over at 5 o'clock this morning and kind of a rough night of sleep, I came in, and I was thinking, I'm about to teach, and I am tired. I don't, I'm not up to this challenge. And suddenly, my own teaching reminded me that I don't have to be up to the challenge. That it's not about me and my strength and my ability and my capability and my gifting. Because the Holy Spirit lives in me. And where I am weak, He is strong. And so I'm sufficient because He is sufficient. Ephesians 1, 19 through 20 says, And, this is amplified again, So that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of His power in and for us who believe, as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The power of God, the same power of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is working in and for us. God's power, the power that hovered over the waters and through God's word created everything that you and I see lives in and for us. And when God puts his spirit in our lives, friends, let me help you understand this. That should give us some real confidence. Why? Because God, God is in and for us. And we don't have to rely on our own power anymore. Instead, we get to rely on His immeasurable, unlimited power. We don't have to muster up some half-hearted, phony baloney, bootstrap, self-help psychology, what this world tells us, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. No, you're not. I'm not okay, and you're a hot mess too. But here's the fact. God says, I put my power in you. And if God says his power is in us, then guess what? That means we are capable in and through him. That gives us great confidence. Philippians 4.13 means something entirely different when you understand. He's saying everything he calls you to do, everything he's purposed for you to do, you can do. Not because you're able, because the Spirit of God is in you and willing and able. And as we live our life according to his ways, according to his Spirit, he can accomplish it through us. Ephesians 3.20 Now, all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or imagine, ask or think. Where's that power? In you. It's not just God's power floating around in the abyss. It's in you. The Spirit of God is in us, and that means we are capable. As we close this today, if I were to call you up here and have you reveal your stories of how you've been hurt, of the pain that you carry, this would be an incredibly, uh, there would be a lot of things to be said. 
And that's heartbreaking to me to know how much pain, how much hurt exists right here in this tent and watching online. How many of you are suffering from really big things? But I want to say a couple of things to you this morning as we close. First is, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. My heart is heavy as I look out at your faces and know the stories and the difficulty in the areas of life that you're experiencing. And I believe part of the reason that we, Silver Creek Fellowship, exist as a church is to be a place of healing for people who have been knocked around in this life, where you can come and be healed physically, emotionally, spiritually, where you can be lifted up in community with a bunch of other people who have also been tossed around in life. My dad loves to say it, and I love that he loves to say it, that this is not a church for perfect people. It's a church for people who have been broken and hurt and who have suffered. It's a church where you can be better, where you can grow in your faith, where you can become more like Christ, where the things that have hurt you in the past don't have to keep on hurting you, where you can become more Christ-like, where you can grow. And if you are interested in that, this is the place for you. No matter how bad you're hurt, no matter how bad you've experienced it in the past, I think the Lord has something to say to you here today. Right out of His Word from Isaiah chapter 61, this is what God says to you today. All who mourn in Israel, He will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair in their righteousness they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for His own glory. I don't know who's hurt you or the hurt that you've experienced in your life. Some of you have some major, major trauma. For some of you, it was more subtle than just that. It was that conditional love that we've been talking about today. But still, you've been trying to prove yourself over and over but God wants you today to hear His truth. God wants today for us to be more influenced by what He says about us than what they said about us. So as we close in prayer today, I just want you again to hear the Word of God spoken over your mind and over your life. So would you join me in prayer? Close your eyes, not because it's more spiritual, but because your neighbor's less likely to bother you. Here's what God has to say to you today. God says to you today that I accept you. God says to you today that you are valuable to me. God says to you today that you are lovable and that he loves you. God says to you today that you are forgivable and that he has forgiven you. And God says to you today that because of my spirit, you are capable. So Lord, we want to hear what you have to say to us today. We want to receive it. We want to apply it to our lives. And we want to let your truth be what guides us and sets us free. Help us, Lord, to break free from wrong thinking. And help us, Lord, to really trust what you have to say. Today, God, we put our hope, our faith, our trust in you and you alone and what you have to say about us. And I pray that you would help us heal from any areas of our hurts. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. We are done. We are finished. Go in peace and serve the Lord and make way for the second service. <laughs>